Welcome to the STR Data Lab. Hello and welcome to another edition of the STR Data Lab. I'm Jamie Lane, Chief Economist at AirDNA, and I'm joined here today with Will Perry. Uh, Will is co-founder and CEO of Altito, a very large uh, property management company uh, based out of Europe, specifically in the UK. Uh, I think that's where you're joining me from today. Will, welcome to the podcast. Thank you very much for having having me. Yeah, um, I am currently based in London, which is where I live, but yeah, often on the move across our various European destinations. So, well, we've come across each other at a few conferences over the past year, sort of AirDNA's sort of European circuit. And uh, I was so impressed by the conferences out there, both uh, Scale Rentals in Barcelona, uh, the uh, Vacation Real, Rental World Summit also in Barcelona this past year. I think it's in Portugal next year. But it it, it seems that there is just a, a different vibe in Europe, a real excitement about where the industry was going or is going where it's been and that there's just so much opportunity out there. Yeah, well, that's um, certainly how we see it. Uh, I mean, I've been in this world, in, in this industry for about 10 years now, uh, and it's it's never a dull moment. Um, and even in the dire times, there's plenty of opportunities. Um, and we've been quite strategic and probably ridden our, a fair share of our luck along the way um, to get to where we are today. But, um, you know, hopefully we'll also get stuck into where, where we might be going in the future as well. Yeah. So, and you mentioned 10 years in the industry and looking at your sort of CV and sort of all the different groups you've been a part of, can you maybe take me back to the start with the London Residence Club of just the founding story, sort of how you got into the industry uh, and how that evolved maybe up into the point of, of uh, Altito in 2019? Absolutely. And please do feel free to stop me or interject if I go on too long, because <laughs> there were there are many twists and turns uh, to this tale. But um, I think like many people in the industry, uh, I actually fell into it. Uh, a good friend of mine, good, an old, old pal, a guy called Tom Archer, um, who was also based in London at the time. And we were 25-ish. Uh, and we were looking to set up a business. We actually had a business uh, together, which we've been running a few years, making apple juice, um, so something totally different. Uh, wow. And we were looking for something a little bit more scalable and profitable over the long term. And we were doing a, a property development in London, a small one um, together. And it was about that time, you can probably remember 2014, 15, where certainly in London, Airbnb was really beginning to motor. Um, mm -hmm. Sort of fifteen to twenty thousand listings a year, and it was moving from this kind of young upstart that was perhaps a bit of a dirty word in in uh, in some circles. Some people a bit unsure about it. The idea still of putting your home on this platform was a bit daunting to some, and, and perhaps didn't quite know how to do it. To a place where actually a lot of owners were thinking, "Wait a minute, I, I want to get a piece of this, and I've got this asset, and I'm not fully utilizing it for for whatever reason that might be." And as a result of that, suddenly there's the barriers to entry to that market were pretty low because there's a lot of demand, a lot of owners out there who are like, I want to do short nets, I don't have the time and energy. And there were lots of people like me and Tom who were trying to set up businesses and thought, okay, well, if we can just persuade a few people to give us some keys, then we're in business. And how hard can this be, right? Um, <laughs> and how, how wrong we were. Um, so... <laughs> So we were right about the opportunity, but like, yeah, I think it was it was probably lucky that we were naive 25-year-olds because we, we didn't quite know what was going to come our way. But um, yeah, we started out, we set up the London Residence Club. The idea was to sound quite grand and, and go for high-end units in, in central and west London. And we started taking on a few properties uh, and, and just the two of us doing everything at that stage, learning as we go. Uh, and we grew grew the business probably nearing up to 100 units over the next uh, couple of years. Uh, and then there was always a, most, most year there was always an inflection point. And, and in 2017, the big one for us was a, a competitor went bust. We didn't really know them very well, but similar size portfolio based in London. And the administration process was happening and the client list was up for sale. Uh, and we, um, we, got, we, we managed to, to buy that list um, again, 
bit of luck and it came our way. And uh, and so suddenly we had added a load more clients to our portfolio, but much more importantly, the way in which they operated was to offshore a lot of their stuff, something we hadn't even thought about. Um, now it's quite common. Back then it certainly wasn't um, in our industry. And, and they had a team of 10 in Bulgaria, never been to Bulgaria before. Um, we went out there, met the team and, and thought this was a very good idea. So, so that office actually we still have today and there's about 100 staff there and is a key part of powering the overall um, business. So we, yeah, so that, that was a key point in 2017. In 2018, we were looking around thinking, well, you know, what's next? And there was a lot of stuff happening in the market. You may remember there's a lot of venture capital money coming into to property managers. Uh, and it was quite an exciting time. Um, and we as an independent business in London probably weren't getting as much attention as the rest, but we thought we had quite a good business. And we, were one, and we thought we needed to, we wanted to push on past this. We wanted to scale it and ideally diversify by getting into some other cities, but we didn't quite know how to do that, having, having never done it before. And we then started going to the conferences that you mentioned, and that became that has become a big part of my life over the last few years. So we went to lots of conferences, met other independent businesses. It turns out a lot of people in the same position, and that was the kind of the seeds, the germination of what, where Altido came from, which was born out of a merger of our business, the London Residence Club, and, and three other businesses in Europe, in Scotland, Portugal, and Italy. So maybe let, let's take a second and sort of dive in a bit on London Residence Club. And so if you guys were around 100 units in 2017, acquired a company or acquired the assets of a company in, in around that time. So in that operations, were you guys solely in London? Had you expanded out to other areas within England or was it you guys were a one market operation? I mean, we were 98% London. I say 98% because the nature of some of our owners meant that they had a chalet in the Alps or a holiday home elsewhere. And some of them said to us, look, we, we know you can't do the operations, but would you like to market? Mm -hmm. We did have a handful of other properties there, but really our core operational business was fully London. Yeah. And were you guys profitable there? Were you guys able to really and scale that business in a way that made sense for scaling further? Yeah. So I guess one thing that stood us was quite smart in hindsight was we had always set out to run a profitable business um, and, we, and an independent one. So we hadn't raised any money. We mm -hmm. didn't really have much money between us. We had enough to scrape together to to buy that client list I, I spoke of. But but re realistically, this was this was our livelihood, and it needed mm -hmm. to make money. And if it didn't, we wouldn't have continued the business. So we were becoming we were always profitable, but we were becoming in more profitable in, in a sort of meaningful way where we were beginning to be able to pay ourselves a decent salary, having lived on apple juice and and the limited profits from that in in the prior years. So. It was it was a nice little independent business, but we were small. And so then, with meeting the founders of the other companies and looks B and B Buddy, uh, in town, uh, Rent Experience, and forming Altito. So was that really the the way that you guys came up with the scale to multiple markets and begin to and go into different cities, create a new brand? Like, what was the impetus behind that merger, sort of forming the new entity, and then? What were the major benefits you guys saw from that? Yeah, well, firstly, full marks of being able to name those other brands because I, I don't think anyone has ever done that before on, on a podcast with me. So yeah, those spot on. Those were the other brands that we met. Similar founder profile, similar-ish size of business. Everyone brought something slightly different to the table. And obviously we had this Bulgarian back office, which was, was an interesting angle as well. So the impetus was this. It was quite clear from speaking you know, going around these other conferences, there were, there were more than just four businesses who were open to this idea. Consolidation in a fragmented industry is always going to be spoken about, but to actually act on it is really difficult. And the reason that's difficult is because people are scared, rightly so. You're, you're taking a big risk with something that you, you begin, you've put a lot of hard work and energy into, you've built something, and now you're going to dilute yourself. You're probably going to give up a significant amount of control and you don't know where that might go. And that could go, that could all go wrong. So there's certainly a leap of faith. You've got to roll the dice. And, and that's with any merger, let alone doing it with four mergers across geographies with guys you've only really known six months, maybe, and met a couple of times. So 
it sounds madness in one sense. And a lot of people thought that, you know, the other people we're talking about did drop out along the way. We were speaking with other companies, but there were four left where we were all pretty committed. And so why, why were we? Why had we all made this decision? Well, I think they, they did it for the same reasons I did, but I'll speak personally in the sense that to really achieve our ambitions, we needed to scale. So we didn't want to just be running an independent business for the next 10, 20, 30 years as a sort of small lifestyle property management business. We wanted to scale this business, create something meaningful, meaningful in the industry, create a brand we can be proud of, and ultimately to exit so, so that we can actually realize all the hard work and effort we've put into that. And so the, the merger was an interesting way of doing that because we'd seen other people raise money and spend a lot of money, but didn't have a huge amount of success. So they diluted themselves anyway, steamed into other markets with a checkbook, spent loads on marketing and didn't really sustain the business in these new markets. And profitability was, was not really there. Whereas with us four as individual businesses who know their markets well and are profitable, it was a way of getting scale overnight, albeit with tons of other challenges of integrating it and making sure the business works together as a, as a unified whole. But you, you speed up that process really quickly and then become quite interesting to the rest of the market. And I'll talk about the benefits in a moment, but there's one other key, key point, which actually I think we couldn't afford not to do it because being an independent company in one place, you're seriously exposed. So even if you want to run that, for the next 10, 20 years, you don't know if you're going to be able to. If regulation comes in, it could wipe you out overnight. Mm -hmm. And so one of the major reasons was actually, well, by having broader sh shoulders, we'll be able to, uh, the long-term sustainability of the business should actually increase. We should be able to protect ourselves from that. In terms of the key advantages, it was all the things you might think that come from, from, from doing a merger of that size. They, they came at different times, but you just get a lot more exposure. People suddenly care about you, whether it be the OTAs, um, suppliers in the industry, investment. That was a key thing. We think we thought we'd be much more attractive to investors as this kind of cornerstone investment in Europe. So all those conversations suddenly started happening. In we did we finalised the deal and went public in went public on the deal. We haven't gone public yet, but in May 2019, and that year pre-COVID was we were getting a lot of attention, which, which really helped us run a, run a good business. Yeah. And I want to ask sort of how it went through COVID, but maybe, maybe sticking on sort of the uh, scale and sort of expansion angle of, and you look at your portfolio today, you guys are in still essentially the same countries, right? So the UK, England, Scotland, Ireland, Italy, Portugal, and it, it looks like you guys have some presence in France too. Is that right? Uh, well, we haven't quite got to that bit of the story, but the final piece which happened in 2022 meant that we were in Spain and France now. So we're in, if you include UK as one region, we're in, we're in five core regions in Europe. So maybe looking at the, at the UK, so you guys started just in, in London, and now it looks like you guys are in throughout in most of England, Scotland, and Ireland. So was that sort of organic growth or was that further acquisitions that put you guys into those markets? A bit of both, uh, but actually in the UK, mostly uh, organic. And, and actually a lot of the other cities we're in is where we, like Dublin is a great example. So we only operate in Dublin in the summer and we do what we call a pop-up hotel, which is where purpose-built student accommodation with a block, I have 200 rooms, we mm -hmm. just let the students move out. We let it in the summer. And we got access to those kind of deals and speaking to the owners and the operators and being taken seriously by them because we were a European group. I'm, I'm sure that had a, a big factor in, and actually you needed to be of a certain level. It's very easy to convince Joe Bloggs down the road who wants to do a bit of Airbnb to give, give you your keys. But when you're speaking to an M&G or an institutional fund, you have to be a, a more credible player with, with a track record. So the expansion within the UK, yeah, mainly, uh, and I think our, our, just our profile helped us a lot with that. Was there anything there to sort of switching from just like a sort of urban property manager to going into sort of more holiday markets along the coast? Was that a, a learning process or was that pretty seamless? So... 
Yeah, that's a good question because particularly during COVID, I mean, we knew about it before COVID that, that we, were, we were primarily an urban property manager and we still are. But pre-COVID, we're like, we, we really wanted to get out into these traditional vacation rental markets, maybe a coastal area, or these, these popular markets, partly because, again, on that diversification piece, it just looked more sustainable and stable over the long term. And also the metrics are quite attractive in terms of the rates you can get and the length of stay. But it's as, as much as we thought about it and said, we've got to do this, we've got to do this. It was really hard to do it. You know, you've, you've got the incumbents there and it's like, it is kind of like starting from scratch again. You've got to, you've got to move into that. You've got to send, get some staff, send them to that, to that location. It's, it's more disparate. You're not in a city, so you're kind of traveling around a lot. And you're, you know, it's, it's hard work to get those units. And I, I feel like those units are stickier to the client. I, once you've got them, you might be with that agency for 20, 30 years. Trying to persuade someone to move is, is quite challenging. So we, we have, and, and then COVID hit, and suddenly those, those ones were doing fantastically. So then we were, there was even more of a reason to have exposure to that. And we were sitting there totally exposed to the urban market, thinking this is really frustrating. We have taken on via our network, via our existing clients, perhaps, you know, a, a percentage of those kind of properties. But to date, our core portfolio is, 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 very, is very much still an urban, urban portfolio, and particularly with, with, with what's happened subsequently with the co-living and the student living and the service apartment stuff we do. I feel like our future will, will be urban as well. So, so given that, and you guys are primarily an urban company, and, and we all know how much COVID hurt urban demand. Just walk us through what what happened in March 2020. How did you guys recover? Sort of what was the impact initially? What was the impact sort of midterm? And then how are you guys looking at and your portfolio today? How is it performing relative to pre-pandemic? Like how did it all play out? Yeah, um, fairly disastrously, as you can imagine. <laughs> yeah, uh, I can imagine. So one good thing is, the, the majority of our business back then was management contract. We did, right. we did have a few leases, a bit of rent to rent in some of the regions, but the vast majority was, was based on a management contract. So we weren't massively exposed in some of the way in, compared to some of the businesses at that time. We knew about it from February because Northern Italy, i.e. Milan, which was one of our big hubs, mm -hmm. was where COVID entered Europe seemingly. And that yep. was where the first lockdown was. And at that point, I remember sitting in a board meeting and we were thinking, okay, this is a problem. We've got tons of cancellations coming through in Italy, but it's an Italian problem. So we'll just, we'll just ring fence that and we'll keep the other businesses going. This is why we diversified. And the Italians told us, um, this is going to come your way. And we were sort of, I guess, hoping it wasn't. <laughs> and, and, and obviously a month later, we realized they were spot on. But at least it, it gave us about a month notice to start making some quite major changes that we realized this was becoming more and more serious. And, and it was just pure survival mode. You know, obviously lots of companies didn't survive and certainly it damaged companies. And for us, there was so much uncertainty. We didn't know whether we were going to get out of it. Um, but the main thing was just being trying to be as financially prudent as we could, really looking at the unit economics of our business. We switched our model like everyone else did to try and, okay, well, what can we do? We can't do short let but there's some mid-let potential here. And that's important because you help retain the client. But realistically, we went from doing about 10 million in 2019 in terms of revenue. And in 2020, we were down to about three, three or four million. And obviously you've got all your overheads as well. So very challenging year. There's a lot of government support, which we were able to, uh, to use, which was fantastic in all the different regions. And that kept us afloat. But ultimately, when we got to the end of 2020, our business was, was in pretty bad shape because we'd lost quite, we were losing clients. We just couldn't retain them all, which was, which was painful. 2021 though, looking ahead, I guess if we try and take the silver linings of it, well, one, we had analyzed our business in a way we'd never done before. So we were becoming a lot more strict with our existing inventory, making sure that works for us with the way in which we operate, with the softwares we use. So we made some software changes. So we were a much leaner business in 2021 and probably better for that. And, and we went back to the whole, one of the major reasons we did the merger, which was, okay, well, we still think we're, there's some attractive things here. And yes, it's been a bad time, but the market will come back and, and we want to seek investment. And so we were able to use 2021 
even though the market still didn't come back. And yes, the the rural areas were having a fantastic time. We weren't. We got up to about seven million. So we, you know, we were we were clawing our way back, but things things were not great. Um, and we'd taken on a load of debt. We'd never had any debt before. We had to take on on, on debt keep things going but we started speaking to investors in the market and ultimately that's what led to the the latest deal we did which we started speaking in may and we finished the deal in january 2022 where this residential operator an italian business called dover vivo ended up acquiring the entire business um, and a number of the founders and key shareholders like myself stayed within the business um, we've been running that business for the last two years uh, or being involved in this larger group and, and there's lots of that, that moves us into a whole new segment. But if we stay with the, the short let side for a while, what that meant was we, we, we were, 2022 then became really exciting. We were able to put money into the business for the first time. We were able to grow in a way we hadn't. And the 2022 market was fantastic. Um, that was, sudden, that was our, our brilliant summer. People were traveling again. It was it was back to 2019, if not better. Uh, and we did about 16 million, 15, 16 million that year. So um, yeah, suddenly the outlook was was good again. But a tough two years. I remember I'm sort of talking about the UK market. It very much seemed like it was a year where people weren't sort of fully comfortable doing international travel again. But you had a lot of UK residents wanting to travel, feeling really comfortable traveling within the UK, traveling different cities. And then maybe 2023 was a bit more normalization back to like, ah, I'd like to get back to France. I'd like to get back to Spain. How do you guys see 2023 perform sort of on a, on, on a relative basis to 2022 if, you, and if it was such a good year? Yeah, it, it's a good point. It, it, I would say it was similar. I mean, it varied from market to market. Um, some weren't quite as strong. I don't think Portugal was quite as strong as it was in, in 2022. But I would say most of the other regions were maintaining similar metrics on 2022. Probably the Americans were coming over more last year than, and than they were before. And I mean, I guess our, our results were slight, in one way slightly masked in the sense that we were Every year on year, I spoke about that inflection point earlier, and obviously 2022 was a big inflection point because we'd had an injection of capital in the business, but we also had some deep pockets behind us. So Starwood Capital is ultimately one of the larger funds and big names in, in our overall group. And mm -hmm. that enabled us to do deals on an inventory side that we'd never be able to even look at. So we're taking on long leases on sort of flagship buildings that we were putting live, so, you know, properties on Leicester Square in, in London and the Westminster, these kind of places where you can do something really interesting and, and, and it's a, a kind of different offering to the market. So it was, a, yeah, an exciting time last year to, to be able to bring on those kind of, kind of deals and certainly kept, yeah, made our, made our numbers look, look very positive. Yeah. And in your seat, sort of, and given that you've been in London so long, and I assume there's quite a few buildings you would have loved to have been in, but you didn't see how to maybe do it, like, and whether it was the risk or the upfront costs of scaling that much or having to take on the long-term leases, like, and obviously having the money of Starwood Capital sort of changes the sort of risk tolerance. But do you still see that sort of growth as sort of profitable in the long term or... Is it sort of a different metric that you guys are looking at? So to be clear, I mean, I mentioned earlier about how the, the DNA of the business was management contract. And, and yes, we, we've taken on some exciting new deals that we, we probably couldn't have taken on before. But also, I think it's a good point. Would we have been comfortable as individuals running an independent business to take on that sort of risk? Probably not anyway. There was probably a reason we weren't doing it. I remember others were. Mm -hmm. um, we're more comfortable being exposed in that way now, but, but the majority of the business in our short let regions is, is still management contracts. So it's more just, it's, it's playing into this diversification piece that I, I speak about a lot, you know, geographically we diversified, but from an inventory perspective, as a residential operator, we're probably one of the most diversified res residential operators out there. I mean, we really do do everything from a student room to a castle. 
which mm -hmm. is pretty unusual, uh, a massive operational challenge for us to, to do internally. And it's a branding challenge as well of trying to explain internally who we are, let alone externally. But with all those challenges, I think that the pros are, the positives are really, really clear. I think in, the, in such a, in every area, every region and every vertical, there is uncertainty and there's risk. And, and we see that. And so I'm, I'm really glad that we are in the position where we are now, um, that we're able to kind of deal with any shocks that happen within the market. And we see them every year, that we're, we are diversified enough and our shoulders are broad enough to be able to withstand them. So w when we were last together, you told me about the name Altido. One, can you explain... <laughs> I mean, it, it seems so a weird name I and mean, sort of a made up word. One, can can you explain it? And then two, like, can you explain to me the sort of new entity that you guys are part of? I see the sort of branding now, Altito by uh, Joyvi and sort of what that is and sort of how the brand's uh, evolving. Yes. Um, and in a way, we, we can potentially, this podcast can be the the memorial service or funeral for, for the Altido brand, which has lived a very happy life for the last five years, but perhaps this is the, the last time it's spoken about publicly. And, and the reason that that is, is because as a group, we've gone through so much M&A uh, mm -hmm. and across different countries that we have all, all sorts of legacy brands and it's time to, to sunset all of them and just, and just start operating and acting as, as one company, which we hope will be, much clearer for the market to understand about who we are. But to say goodbye to Artido, so a lot of people didn't know that, but the ones who did were, were the lucky few. So Artido stands for a life that I dream of. People thought it might be an Italian or Latin name, but it's um, all to do with altitude, but it's actually, a, it was an aspirational guest-facing brand. And the idea back in 2019 was, well, we had all these other brands and there were, there were lots of property managers who would you know, their, their pitch was very much to the, to the host, you know, host maker is a, an, an obvious one, a very clear one is like, you know, we're here as a property manager. There weren't as many trying to offer something from a hospitality perspective to the guest. And so we, we wanted to have this aspirational brand where guests could come and stay with us. And, and the, it was all about dreams. So you come and come on holiday and you fulfill some of your dreams with, with, with us as a brand. And that, that brand served us well. And I think became quite well known, certainly within the industry over the last few years. And, and as we spoke about, made a bit of a splash when, when we first created it. But, but yeah, saying goodbye to that, much more importantly, looking forward to the future is Joyvee. And Joyvee is already out there in the public domain from a, from a landlord perspective. It's the, the, the brand we now use. We, we've got Altido and the other brands are, are purely just still there because our, our guests know us as that. But come Q2... Um, we'll be saying goodbye to those brands and, and Joy V again, actually in, embodies similar values. I mean, joy is in the word. You could say Joy de V from, from France as well. It's about, it's a happy, fun brand that is catering, uh, for yes, the short length market, the holiday market, but also a large, well, actually the lion's share of our, of our turnover of our business, which last year was about 110 million euros in terms of our revenue and 75% uh, of that was on the co-living and student living side. Um, and so Joyv represents this residential operator, this European residential operator. Right. And uh, yeah, hopefully this year, you guys will be seeing a lot more of us as, under that brand. Yeah, so the Joyv platform seems pretty big and combining co-living, student housing, multifamily, co-working, obviously short-term lets, rentals, vacation rentals. Looking at it though, it seems like, and maybe the introduction of Starwood Capital that there's a mix of, or now a much broader mix of both institutional ownership buildings and then individual owners, like the traditional, and I've got one or two homes and how do you guys think about sort of future growth? Is it a combination of the two? Is it I'm going more after institutional buildings where you can scale more quickly? Like I'm guessing much easier to keep an institutional owner happy than a thousand individual owners as you, as you sort of grow the brand and grow the inventory. But how do you guys think about it? 
I, I mean, you're spot on. I think you're in the wrong job. You should come and do my job because because that is that is how we think about it. I mean, it, obviously, our, our, our the, the foundation was was after those individual owners and those individual homes. And, and we still, you know, I'm proud that we still have a lot of those, even from the early days. Some of them have been with us for many years. But, you know, the size we've got and the scale we're, go- scale we're going for, it's inevitable that, you know, getting exposure to or access to those kind of larger um, buildings that we can we can take on that that they are really important just for you know to to, to know that you you take on that asset and you lease it for ten years or so and and that's a a fantastic revenue and you get the stream um, for, for for the next ten years and is really important when you're you know dealing with the kind of investors that we are is that to say that we just don't cater for the rest of the market at all? No, because I, I still think we have something to offer there and our teams are set up for it. It's just about the weighting of how that is and perhaps being a bit more, you know, as I spoke in COVID, we were becoming a bit more discerning about what we take on. So making sure there's no opportunity cost through spending lots and lots of time on just one individual owner and it's only going to be with us for a year or two. So, you know, being careful about the type of property it is that we take on. Does it fit with our portfolio? Is the owner going to be the kind of owner we want to work with and then yeah it's it's yeah continuing to grow the rest of the portfolio the, the, the other thing is m a um we've spoken about it a lot and it's still today is 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 definitely a part of our strategy and um for sure we will i i'm sure we will be doing four or five deals this year um and when i know of a few that we're working on at the moment um and and just to go a little bit deeper into our geographical spread we do short let in UK, Portugal, and Italy historically, and then we do co-living in Italy, Spain, and France. And so the historic. And so the idea is to bring co-living into the regions where we're just short let, and to bring short let into the regions where we're just doing co-living. France is a great example. We've got the Olympics coming up this year in Paris. We've got a thousand beds on the co-living side. It makes so much sense to be offering a short let offering this summer. And we started doing that in France and London is in, you know, London and the UK and in my new role in the Joyvee group, I will be UK and Ireland general manager. So um, one of the key goals for me this year is to bring co-living here. And, and I'm sure we're, well, we're looking at acquiring a co-living player in, in London. So that will help kickstart that, that vertical. Yeah. And then as you guys think about further expansion um, into Europe are you got and m a opportunities is it essentially just growing the markets and countries that you in and their offerings or is it expanding geographical in terms of the countries that you might operate in and, and bringing your services to yeah um, and these questions are, are spot on I'm beginning to think you might have access to our, our board strategy because <laughs> not, it, we're, we're doing both so so we're it's key that there's so much room to grow uh, in the markets we are already in, and it's key to continue to consolidate that, continue to grow that. And we've got so many verticals that there's, we're not short of growth options within the markets we're in, and we want to, we we need to, and want to keep growing. We're probably growing at about thirty percent a year at the moment, and so we will continue to do that in the markets we are via organic, by a combination of organic growth and and some strategic acquisitions. Should should they pop up you know present themselves it's opportunistic on that front Mm -hmm. and then outside of those regions our main route to growth really is is to acquire as we enter those new markets and that goes back to the same reason i said we formed altivo it's if you're going into a brand new market that you know nothing about in terms of how to operate from a regulatory perspective and financial and fiscal and all these challenges it just makes it's expensive but it makes your life so much easier if you're able to get a foothold in a decent acquisition so um as we look at other european countries that and we are um i would have thought by the end of this year start of 2025 we will be opening up one or two more regions um in europe and that will be VAR acquisition that's great so we we talked about the London Residence Club, we talked about Atito, we talked about Joyvee, the sort of expansion that's happening there, sort of co-living, short-term let, and you're now going to be overseeing all of UK, Ireland in terms of short-term let and expansion. So 
you've seen the industry evolve so much, I assume, over these past 10 years that you've been operating this space. So what gets you excited about the industry? Where do you see it going? What, what do you see next over the next like few years that gets you excited to come to work every day? Yeah, it's, it's, um, it's a good question. And, and you're asking that to a man who, who fell into this industry by mistake. So, yeah. <laughs> um, so I'm not sure how, I, how excited I was at the start, but, uh, but it's been, I mean, it's, I talked about those inflection points and it's been such a roller coaster the last 10 years. And I have learned tons about the industry and tons about myself. And hopefully I'm a better at all the things I was terrible at the start. I was terrible at hiring. I was a terrible people manager. I, I was, I'd get very nervous about small things, you know, that a guest rang us up and they got no heating and I, you know, have a nervous breakdown. And, and now, you know, we, we as a group and as individuals have clearly come a long way since then. And so all of that has provided me with a ton of excitement. And, and then when it became international, the travel has been great to be able to meet with these other cultures, see these other challenges. And, and there's certainly an intellectual stimulation in, in solving all, the, all these challenges across the group. I think I'll try and answer the, what gets me excited about the industry, but, but it's certainly just looking internally, I got a huge amount to be excited about. Uh, as as what we're doing as a group, so so look, the concept of Joyv is a massive, um, is a hugely ambitious and a massive challenge. It hasn't really mm. been our, our ultimate goals haven't. It doesn't really exist in the market, and so we're we are going to be trying to break new ground with the technology we're going to be bringing in and, and the service we'll be offering. So, so that keeps me busy and excited on a on a day to day basis, and 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 leading the UK is more than enough of a challenge for me over the next couple of years. In terms of the industry as a whole, I, I think when we started looking externally and attending these conferences over the last five or six years, what you notice, or my limited experience of other industries, I worked in um, finance and in consulting for a bit, is it's it's just a, a very, it's quite, still quite got this young feel about it. It's hugely dynamic, um, very friendly. Uh, and a lot of fun, as in you'll know from attending these conferences. It's just a, a very collaborative, positive vibe, um, even in when you're faced with major challenges like COVID and like regulation. So things can be pretty gloomy and pretty tough, but people have a, a real can-do spirit. And so, you know, when I look ahead to this year and, and I'll be attending the VRMA and some of the scale events and, and the Short Stay Summit, I'm always excited to reconnect with the industry, I've made lots of friends, uh, and yeah, it, I'm sure it will be another very busy year ahead. Yeah. So, and maybe last question. And typically, I ask a a data question, but given that you're in the UK and we just made our own acquisition of a, a property management system that's users are primarily UK based um, through uplisting, I suspect we're going to get a whole lot of sort of smaller hosts operating in the UK market, sort of listening in. And if you think back to 2015, 2016, when you were first getting going, do you have any advice for the sort of small operators or someone with maybe one, two, three listings and just getting going of what they should maybe be thinking about? What What's one or two things they should do as they get going? should stop and get into the apple juice market <laughs> something thing. way more scalable yeah 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 uh no i um i do have some advice and, and i i speak to actually a lot i do this quite a lot when i attend conferences and chatting to business of all shapes and sizes and the thing which really benefited myself and and our other co-founders particularly tom who i set up the london residence club with is we would always have these check-in sessions where we tried to be as honest with ourselves about what we are doing, uh, why, why we're doing it, and when we want to achieve these things by. And we would write that down and, and agree that between us and then hold each other accountable. Because I think there is a danger in the industry that because you can fall into it, that you don't quite know where you're going. And that's not to say you need a massive plan that you should you know, cost to the very nth degree because things never turn out like but you should be really honest with yourself about what your personal ambitions are. That's what has guided Tom and I through this whole journey to where we are now, because we knew when we were creating the London Residence Club, and it was doing okay, we were, we, we, we were a nice little business, but it wasn't where we wanted to be. And so if we had just, there's a danger you can become a kind of, 
you think you're a lifestyle business, but you're not really because you're on call 24 seven and it's like, you're earning okay money, but is it enough that you basically don't have a social life or a guest could call you at any moment, which is what it was like. So my advice is be so, so honest with yourself about where you want to go. Because if you are, if you're in this, that you think you've created a business, you own the entire business or you own it with your co-founder and you really believe that that share capital is worth something, then you need to do something interesting to, if you ever expect to get an exit that is half decent, because it's actually very hard, particularly now. I mean, you, you may have got away with it pre COVID, but property management businesses are, you know, they're, they're, they're hard to get to a place where you can sell it for what most people would, would view an exciting exit. So you need to be very honest about how your strategy is to get there. And for us, it was going down this merger route and, and risking t t taking a leap of faith and saying, well, is the alternative really that bad? Well, the alternative was it's just going to be doing the same thing. And actually why not? Like we can we, we built it from nothing. Um, we didn't have a huge amount to lose in one sense and certainly it paid off for us. So um, I would, I would encourage those co-founders to, or those individual founders to, to take, think about that and, and then take big risks if, if, if they actually do have ambitions. That's great. Well, thank you so much for joining the podcast. Look forward to seeing you again on the, maybe on the conference circuit and, and you're up this year. And if you can leave our listeners where to find you, where to find more about Joyvee. Sure. Yeah. So you can get me on LinkedIn. Um, yeah. William Parry at, at, and, and well, soon to be, it will be changed to Joyvee soon and, and Joyvee.com. Uh, you can see, see the wider group. Um, but yeah, always happy to have a chat with anyone. And so do get in touch. Yeah. Interested to hear your story. Awesome. Thanks, Will. Thanks. Thanks.